I must say that I really am enjoying the uh, impact of television, except that it's cost me a lot of money. Uh, you got to tip more. See, I, there's a place where I always go in for my breakfast, and now, when I went in the day after the show, they all recognize me. You can't leave 20 cents when they know you. So that's another nickel. <laughs> new places but I'll tell you something everybody wants your television so no matter where I go it costs extra and then on the bus it cost me more now I got on the bus next day I was going to work I you know I'm pretty tight with the book you know look I may have to support myself for the rest of my life <laughs> so I'm not taking any chances so I get on the bus and I'm clutching the two dimes and the bus driver says to me I saw you on the par show so I got so excited, I dropped the 20 cents in there. <laughs> now I said, did I put 20 cents in there? You have to give me a nickel back. He says, I can't do that. You got to wait until somebody comes on who has a nickel change. Well, I sat in the bus, and everybody that got on had exact change. They kept, you know, and I sat there, and I went past where I work and everything. <laughs> To me, it's a nickel. You don't find a nickel in the street, you know. <laughs> so I finally got off the bus and took a cab back to the meeting. <laughs> oh, I got to tell you about the uh, t uh, taking a check. Since I've been on the show, uh, you know, people recognize me. Well, anyway, uh, I walk along the street, and, uh, you know, people say Selma. You know, I'm like a one night, like uh, Hildegard, Picasso, you know, uh, Garbo. They, you know, Drano. You know, one night, uh, so it's, you know, it's clean living. Well, anyway, this, uh, as a matter of fact, this afternoon, I was on my, uh, I left the theater at the Como show, and I, uh, I passed a little shop on Madison Avenue, and I saw something in the window that I might like, so I went in and tried it on, it fit, and I was gonna pay for it and didn't have any money. And then I thought, well, I'll talk to the owner, maybe he'll take a, a check. So I started giving him a check, and I don't have any identification. So he said to me, don't worry about that, I don't know where to get you, and if the check isn't good, I'll collect from Jack Parr. I thought that was nice, and I uh, tried the thing on, you know, the fit, and he wraps it up. So as I'm walking over here, I remembered uh, that the bank sent me a notice this morning that I was overdrawn. So while I'm here, Jack, I want to thank you for my new girdle. <laughs> but the check's no good. But the girdle's good. Uh, who says that? You know, I wear the, <laughs> I wear the practical stuff. <laughs> Over the weekend, you know, the, the trade fair was going to close, so I ran down. And uh, I feel that as an American, I should go and, uh, you know, buy little things. I, I want them to see that I'm friendly to the country. So uh, I passed the Israeli booth. Uh, I'm more than friendly with them. <laughs> I made a small purchase, and it was bubble gum made in Israel. Really? And I was thinking to myself, you know, bubble gum from the Holy Land. You know, it's like finding uh, a Coke machine in a confessional. <laughs> it's, it's just wonderful. Bubble gum made in Israel. They're really moving ahead. You know, <laughs> bubble gum, you know? Oh, you know about this... Uh, a lot of the schools around New York keep sending the reporters over to interview me. So this little uh, girl comes over from a girls' college the other day, and she says, uh, we want to know if a career in television as a writer compensates for marriage. Now, that's crazy. You know, on a cold night, you're going to warm your feet on the back of a typewriter? <laughs> she, oh, another thing she wanted to know was how old a girl should be before uh, she can go to a prom, you know, wearing a strapless dress. So I said, uh, if it stays up, you're old enough. <laughs> Oh, 
I must tell you, I thought I'd go see my aunt, who I hadn't seen in quite some time, because I'd been living out in California. And uh, I went up to see her. And she said, uh, what have you been doing out in Hollywood? And I said, uh, I've been writing for Groucho Marx. She says, with his mouth, he needs you. <laughs> so she said, uh, you want to make calls? And I said, that's right. She said, uh, you know somebody in the business? I said, no, no. She said, uh, somebody gave it to you? I said, no, I walked into a store and bought it. She says, retail? I said, that's right. She said, are you trying to tell me that a single girl walks into a retail store and buys a mink coat? And I said, yes, I did that. She, you know, because it's like mass rejection, paying for your own mink coat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just then, her neighbor knocked down the door. My aunt says to me, it's my neighbor, hide the coat. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, I, you know, I wore it for about eight or nine years, and it's getting old, and uh, that was the wrong word, you know. <laughs> but uh, I had to go and buy another one. It's pretty unpleasant going to bed at night, thinking this one wears out, and I'll have to buy another one. <laughs> So I have a friend who's uh, married, and she made a date for me, and I kind of liked him, you know, and uh, when the evening was over, I told him that I liked him. She called me the next day. She says, don't do that. You're supposed to keep a man guessing. Well, what am I going to start kidding around? You know, I meet somebody I like. If I got time, you know, this is it, and if this doesn't work out, we'll go and find somebody else. So she says, no. And she says, I'm married, and my husband is still guessing. So I thought, well, you know, maybe. You know, I've been thinking about it. You know, she's been married five years. She has four children, and one on the way. Oh. I've been thinking, where's the guess work? <laughs> Oh, and then I, ha oh, I had uh, one experience, uh, Gertrude Berg, you know, I was over. So she has this big place out in the country, and uh, she invited me up. So she says, I'm sending a bachelor down to pick you up, a doctor, so and so. So I get dressed, you know, and I go downstairs, and I wait for him. He drives up, and I get in the car. And as we get out of my driveway, he says, uh, let's stop and get the car washed. I said, what for? We're going to drive three and a half hours up in the country. It'll only get dirty. He said, I want to have the car washed. Well, it wasn't with his car. So we stop, and I have to get out, you know, while he has the car washed. I get back in the car. I figure, what am I doing with Mr. Clean, you know? <laughs> you know, it's a three and a half hour drive, and I make myself comfortable, and I lit a cigarette. Now, he's not watching the road. He's watching where I'm putting the ashes. <laughs> so I put the cigarette out. You know, I figure you just meet somebody, you don't give them trouble. You know, that comes later. So we drive along. You know, I'm not smoking. I'm hungry. So I said, uh, I'm hungry. So he said, all right, we'll stop at a restaurant. And I said, oh, let's not get involved with that. Just get some frankfurters. And we'll eat those. So he goes out and gets them, and he comes back, and he's standing outside of the car. He's not going to let me eat in the car. <laughs> so I got out of the uh, car and ate the fine clothes. I get back in the car. You know, I think, you know, who needs this? With this fall, I'm going to have to give up smoking, eating. You know, so, uh, so all I saw is that I was with an outpatient, you know. <laughs>
tell you something. A fellow wrote to me, and uh, this fellow said that he and his friend, he had four friends, they were all single, and they were going up to the country for the weekend, and uh, just to show that it was really legitimate, uh, he enclosed a brochure of the place where they were going to be. So I opened up the brochure and it's Grossinger's. <laughs> Grossinger's is where uh, people like me go. <laughs> oh, so many like me. <laughs> and uh, fellas like the fellow that wrote to me. And you get together. But it doesn't always work. Because I went up there uh, some time ago. And, uh, you know, I get into my bathing suit, and I thought I'd go around the pool. That's where most of the action is. <laughs> and, uh, as I'm walking towards the pool, sure enough, fella comes over. I say, yes, <laughs> So, I didn't even begin to spin the web, and I've made it, you know. So, uh, he says to me, uh, you know, are you going uh, to swim? And I've discovered something. Don't tell him that you can swim. So I said, no, I don't swim. He says, I'll teach you that much, I know, you know. So I said, oh, that would be delightful. And I'm looking at him. You know, he's not bad. We could make it. <laughs> so I said, uh, as we get towards the pool, I'm thinking that this will be all right, you know. And suddenly he turns to me, I'm so glad you showed up for the weekend. He says, I was getting so tired of the young ones. <laughs> tell you how I think of marriage. You get up in the middle of the night, you're thirsty. So you say, uh, I want a drink. At least there's somebody there who says, you're thirsty? Then get out of bed and get yourself a drink of water. Yeah. You know, it's friendly. <laughs> I figured something out. You know, when you're not married, it takes twice as long to get rid of a cold. <laughs> because uh, I had a date, and I had to call her up and break the date because I was in bed. So he said, well, I'll come up and see you. Now, when you have a cold, you're supposed to stay in bed. Well, if a fella's coming up, I had to get out of bed, put lipstick on, you know, comb my hair. And you can't walk around with the flannel bathrobe, you know, with the torn binding. So you got to put on what you get for Christmas, you know, with the ribbons hanging. And that's a great day, you know. So, uh, you know, I had to do that a couple of times. And then I figured, you see, when you're married, you can stay in bed, look like a slob, get over the cold, nobody cares. <laughs> You know, if you see me walking with a man at 3 o'clock in the morning, I said, oh, she must be working uh, late on a script with a fella. You know, nobody ever thinks I, oh, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I really don't care. You see, a lot of times I work on a show, and uh, the fellas are uh, going to be separated from their wives. And uh, by the time we work on another show, they remarry. <laughs> so, you see, what has happened, when they're in between wives, I'm in between shows. <laughs> now, I notice that I'm a continent. See, Paris is the place. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it's expensive for me because, uh, you know, I can't go family plan. You know, when you're... <laughs> but I go anyway. And I was thinking, you look at Paris, it's so romantic and... Uh, it's like everybody's in love with each other. You know, even during the day, they have their arms around each other, and if they feel like uh, kissing, this is in the daylight, you know, they kiss, they carry on all the time. And you look at Paris, it's like a great big motel. <laughs> you see, you work with man, well, it's like, uh, you know, being Red China, I'm there, they just don't recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> and they treat 
do like one of the boys, and I hate this, because they're not that nice to each other. <laughs> and I, I feel like in spite of the fact that you're a woman in business, you should be treated like a woman. You know, does it hurt if the fellow helps me on with my coat, or uh, you get into an elevator, you take your hat off, or if I walk into a room, isn't it nice if somebody stands up? I like that. So one day, uh, this is out in Hollywood when I go to work on a show, you know, all these preliminary meetings where uh, you meet the other writers and the agency people and the comedian, the producer, and the director. And I walk into the conference room, and sure enough, the comedian stands up. I was so touched by this. I said to him, you know, you're the only man in the room who stood up when I walked in. He said, well, I guess I'm the only man wearing tight jockey shorts. <laughs>
like myself. Well, naturally, she was flattered by this. Now, the night of the performance, uh, she came out, and a, she even topped herself. She was even more magnificent. And she walked off after doing this thing, really sobbing, very emotional. And as she got off the stage, she turned to the drummer in the band and said, did Thelma cry again? <laughs> Well, uh, let me see about the uh, good ears. Well, one day we were coming home from work, and with all his money, I live even further east than he does, you know. So we get in the cab, and I'm going to drop him off. So he mumbles uh, his address to the cab driver, and the cab driver says, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear you. And Goody repeats it, and the cab driver says, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. So this kind of got Goody, and he said, uh, you know, uh, I was on radio for 20 years making my living as an actor. And the cab driver turned around, and he says, you know, I didn't understand you then either. <laughs> <laughs> What's nice about working for Perry? Uh, you know, I have my religion and my faith, and working for Perry, you know, I'm covered by his. You know, with Father Bob is there. So, well, he wasn't there for about a week. And, my, you know, uh, my whole security was shaken. So when he showed up again, I said, Father Bob, you know, I, I have a dependency now because I got two religions working for me. You know, I have double indemnity. What can I do? <laughs> so uh, he said, well, he had to uh, visit some other uh, parishes for a while. I guess he was on the road selling the good book. <laughs> Jack Parm being on the show, and that's why they recognized me. 
So he gave me another dollar and he said, now you tell me who Jack Parr is. <laughs> Listen, I want to tell you something. Over the weekend, I was uh, working, you know, I was writing. I had a phone rang, you know, and I thought, well, I'm home, I'll answer it. And uh, this agent calls up, and he says, uh, you know, they're uh, making some inquiries about you from the coast. Uh, they want to know, uh, they're considering you for the Cary Grant, new Cary Grant Darth Day picture. So I think to myself, you know, these agents, they go to lunch, they have those martinis during the day, you know, and he comes back to his office and he thinks of these things. So I said, oh, why don't you, uh, you know, pull the blinds in your office and sit quietly and maybe this whole thing will go away. Because, you know, let's face it, there are more people out that are ill. You know, and agents are a lot of these people, you know. So uh, I hung up, and he called back, and he said, no, I really mean this. He said, uh, they're thinking of you for the uh, Cary Grant dot so I'm thinking to myself, uh, listen, why not? What's wrong with that? But I can't get enthusiastic. So I was talking to Paul Keyes. So I said to Paul, uh, you know this crazy thing happened? They're talking to me about the Cary Grant picture. So Paul, real seriously, says to me, you know, so I'm a car, you know, it's not a bad opportunity. Cary Grant's never made a bad picture. So I've been thinking about it. He's never made a bad picture. I've never made a bad picture. <laughs> My aunt whom I adore. She's a little old lady, you know, who's married off uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So as far as she's concerned, you know, I'm a waste of time. But I'm a relative, you know. So uh, I didn't hear from her after the show, and I thought, uh, that's odd. You know, everybody called me up. So I called her up, and I said, uh, this is Salma. She says, I don't know you. <laughs> and then I said, maybe you don't know me. And she doesn't answer. So I figured, oh, she's mad. You know, I did something. And I figured it's getting near Passover, and I don't want to cut off my sauce of chicken fat because she <laughs> I never buy a plump chicken, you know, for one. I have dates once in a while. I get a broiler, and they come to my house, I cook. So they eat the other half of chicken. <laughs> so finally I said to her, tell me what you're mad about. And she says, well, she says, to visit Jack Parr, you've got time. For me, you haven't got any time. Because <laughs> I was there last week, you know. So I said, first of all, uh, how do you know I was on the show? She says, I watch the show all the time. So I said, are you a fan of Jack Parr's? She says, I'm not a fan. I can't sleep. <laughs> so uh, then I said to her, well, it was fun. Wasn't it fun? Everybody was laughing. She says, sure. And you were sitting there getting older, and everybody's laughing. <laughs> and I was crying. because. She <laughs> Passover, I went over there uh, to see her, so uh, she says to me, you're here? So I said, what do you mean I'm here? I said, you know, I come here every year for the Seder. So she says to me, uh, uh, I'm surprised to see you. So I said, well, why should you be so surprised? She says, well, she says, the way you're running to Jack Parr, I thought this year you were going to Jack Parr's Seder. <laughs> well, we're all Americans here. We should know what a Seder is. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what it is. It's, um, it's a festival that celebrates the exodus from Egypt. You know, this is the exodus we managed without Sal Medio. <laughs> because with my aunt, the whole world is Jewish. Really? And you know, I kid her about this a lot, so uh, after this last presidential election, I figured I've got her. 
So I said, uh, how do you like uh, President Kennedy? She says, uh, I like him. I voted for him. So I said, you know, he's not Jewish. She says, who says? <laughs> oh, I said, now, wait a minute. The whole world knows that uh, President Kennedy isn't Jewish. She says, I don't know. <laughs> that celebrates a famous man's birthday, she says he's Jewish. Like uh, Lincoln's birthday, Lincoln was Jewish. But the man who shot Lincoln wasn't Jewish, but Lincoln was Jewish. Washington's birthday, Washington was Jewish. And you can't argue, or, of course, Christmas, there's no argument. <laughs> You know, I called her over the weekend to alert her that I was coming on the show. So she said she'll stay up and watch. She says, but I gotta tell you something. There's something you're doing wrong on the show with Jack Carr. So I said, don't tell me. It'll only make me nervous. So she said, well, I gotta tell you what you're doing wrong. So I said, oh, all right, what? She says, you're looking fat. <laughs> I said, uh-uh. I said, that's me. I said, they put the camera on me, and that's the way I come out. So she says, it doesn't have to be that way. Talk to the cameraman. I said, what can he do? She says, look, he can do something. Talk to him. Give him a quarter. You'll see the difference. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. You know, that she's become very showbiz. Well, this friend of mine said, Dorfman, so while I was working on a show, it's there. And his mother used to invite all us. stuff. Uh, uh, people over, you know, she makes soup, soup, right? the, the great cook, you know, wonderful cook. So we're saying now, we're all talking about television and pictures, and suddenly she says, uh, oh, I read in Variety that Daryl Zanuck is uh, going into production with a new picture, so we kind of looked at her, and Sid said to her, what do you know about Daryl Zanuck? You don't even know who Daryl Zanuck is. She says, of course I do. He says to her, well, who's Daryl Zanuck? She says, Daryl Zanuck's one of the Warner Brothers. <laughs>